Hi, everyone. Welcome to this month's uh, IFTTC monthly webinar. Uh, today, we have uh, Martin Unwin uh, presenting on uh, an ESA GNSS hydrology mission. Uh, before he kicks us off, I just want to remind everyone uh, we have these every month uh, at this time, first Thursday of the month, 8 a.m. Pacific. And we have quite a few slots available in the coming months. So if you or someone you know uh, would like to present or is something you'd like to see, just drop me an email and we can look at getting them on the schedule. Uh, so if you have any questions during the talk, you can put them into the chat or at the end of the talk, you can raise your hand and I will call on you. With that, I'll hand it over to Martin. Thank you for joining us today and for sharing your work with us. Well, thank you very much, Dustin, Pyrus, and Shmarashmi and, and the team for inviting me. Um, I'm very pleased to be here. And I'm going to talk about Hydrogen SS and a bit about SSTL, uh, the company that I work for, uh, as well. So when I talk about Hydrogen SS, I'd like to acknowledge that there are there's a lot of um, support from um, a wider team that's gone into this. There's a, a lot of work from you can see the uh, European organizations down below the logos and also we work very closely with the European Space Agency and also I'd like to acknowledge all the hard work from my uh, colleagues in Surrey Satellite Technology Limited. So first I'll talk a bit about uh, Surrey Satellite Technology Limited. Now this is a spin-off from the University of Surrey. It spun off in 1985 to uh, uh, build and commercialize small satellites. It's based, um, it's been off, spun off from the University of Surrey. Now it's owned by um, Airbus. It's part of the Airbus uh, larger group, but uh, we retain the brand of SSTL. And it's all about building small satellites. And when I started my PhD based at the University of Surrey um, back in the 90s, there were very few uh, satellite companies uh, making small satellites specifically. Very few in the UK, not many in the US, and hardly any anywhere else in the world. Since then, uh, of course, everyone knows things have changed. There are hundreds of companies that make small satellites, um, and they range from universities making CubeSats, um, private startups with uh, great ideas, um, all the way up to um, large companies making small satellites to billionaires, well-known billionaires who put up hundreds of small satellites um, providing internet communications and so on. So uh, satellites have, the, the, the world of satellites has changed and we like to think that we played a major role in the uptake of small satellites. So where are we now? Well, we are a prime um, for different missions. We have about 400 staff. We've launched about 72 satellites and we, um, because we are uh, largely ver vertically, in vertically integrated, we make a lot of the subsystems ourselves. We have um, full capability to go from all the way from design, build, test. Um, we ne um, negotiate with launchers um, and we operate ourselves as well. So it gives us uh, the full control over the missions. And we also provide on-the-job training for uh, organizations that, that need, or, or countries that need training in space missions. And we concentrate on building things at a good value. So we're often the first choice when a, a company wants to invest in small satellites. These are some of the satellites that we are um, have been building and launching over the past five or so years. Um, and they range from Galileo payloads, which we, we had on, on uh, we built the payloads for some 34 Galileo satellites. Um, there's satellite we built for Kazakhstan, Carbonite 2, a video ca a satellite. Elsa D was uh, a, a satellite built to be chased and captured as part of the Clean Space Initiative. For MOSAT 7, some people know it as Cosmic 2, um, it's a constellation built. Um, for and with Taiwan and US to take radio occultation measurements. DOT-1, a small technology satellite, um, LEO Vantage 1 or LEO Phase 1. Novasar, which is a radar satellite and uh, 
SSTL 300 S1, which was a one meter imaging satellite, and OTB1, which carried a, a, a deep space clock into space. We built some hardware for the James Webb telescope. Um, we built the uh, avionics for several Canopus satellites. Um, we built um, removed debris satellite, which was demonstrating harpoon and net for um, helping clear this clear space. Um, that's something we did with the University of Surrey. We built the Vesta CubeSat, which is a um, frequency filing satellite, and the other end of the um, uh, scale, we built a geostationary satellite called Quantum. So we've been very busy over the past few years. And here's a taster of what we're doing at the moment. We're building the second of the satellite view satellites to, that is imaging uh, the uh, the carbon, or rather the thermal emissions footprints from buildings to identify where which buildings need more insulation or giving out more heat. We're um, building the Lunar Pathfinder. I'll talk about that in the next slide. We're building a satellite called Project Taiki, which is providing uh, the first asset to um, the UK Space Command. Hydro GNSS, I'll be talking about that. Microsar is a, a radar mission to provide large area maritime surveillance for Space Norway. Theos 2 satellite, um, Theos 2TS, is a small satellite that will be launched for Thailand quite soon. And CARBSAR is a, a demonstrator demonstrating the um, deployment of uh, a, an antenna that will provide high resolution SAR from a very small satellite. And we're also building another satellite not listed here called Mula for and with um, the Philippines. Lunar Pathfinder is um, a satellite that we're building in um, partnership with ESA and with NASA following six years of close collaboration. And the satellite is at a similar level of readiness to um, Hydrogen SS, it's well on the way. And that will be um, launched and will go into a stable orbit around the moon, providing a demonstration of um, communication links to any vehicle that might be on the moon. And the longer term aim behind this is to um, follow it with a, a constellation, small constellation called Moonlight, which will provide communications and navigation service for um, assets that are orbiting or landing and traveling around on the moon. Now on to Hydrogen SS. So the Scout program is a new program from the Earth Explorer, sorry, the Earth Observation D uh, Directorate in the European Space Agency. And it is a, a new initiative in trying to build small um, satellites, trying to tap into new space to achieve um, real science. So it's like a mini Earth Explorer. If you know the Earth Explorer missions, then this is a small one, which is the aim to show that science can be done um, from small satellites. So the rules were a budget of 30 million euros and three years from kickoff to launch. And we were um, submitted a bid amongst 16 other scout bids back in 2019. And we were selected um, as one of the two scouts that were selected to proceed. And the Hydro GNSS program comprises two identical satellites which are using GNSS reflectometry to measure soil moisture and other um, hydrological parameters. So SSTL is at the lead, is leading a team of international scientists from Italy, Spain, Finland, UK, and Austria. And here's a picture from our calibration validation workshop we held um, last year um, with partners, ESA customers, and SSTL staff. And we were having this meeting to discuss plans for calibration and validation of the scientific measurements. So now uh, GNSS reflectometry has become established, but um, if you'll forgive me, I'll, I'm going back a few steps here to when there was a time when people didn't know that GNSS reflectometry could be useful for remote sensing. So people had talked about this. There was some early um, work done in, uh, in the 90s um, that perhaps GNSS could be used as a radar source. For those of you that aren't familiar, 
um, the, uh, ev well, most people are familiar with um, GPS and GNSS. It's, it's a navigation satellite system um, that is at high altitude, around 20 to 24,000 kilometers. GPS is the original US system. Galileo is a European version, and there's also the Russian GLONASS system, Chinese Beidou system. There's also regional systems, Japanese, Indian, and then there's space-based augmentation services and, and so on, and, and they all have some similarities. There's over 100 sources of these transmitters. They're at high altitude transmitting continually, and each signal transmitted with something like 50 watts downwards towards the Earth. Originally, these signals were for military application, but many, many more civil applications have emerged for air, for ship, for land vehicle, mobile phones, and, and, and so on and so forth. They are L-band signals. That's around 1.2 to 1.6 gigahertz. Um, the main signals that are used, the open signals, are around 2 megahertz or 4 megahertz, and it, they can go up to 40 megahertz bandwidth. They have atomic um, timing stability, so that's the main characteristics. But they're not designed for radar. Their they're, they're amplitude is not designed to be used for scatterometry. Um, they're not maybe wide enough bandwidth, not high enough power for radar. Um, and how stable is the amplitude? So in the world of GP GPS, GNSS, which is where I came from, my background, um, uh, reflections of GPS and GNSS were unwanted. These are signals bouncing off surfaces. It's unwanted noise. It's referred to as multipath, and it often degrades the accuracy, and it can sometimes give completely the false position. If you're driving a car um, through, through um, tall high-rise buildings or by the side of a mountain range, you can get reflections that actually put you in the wrong position. And in the past, extreme reflections were seen off the ocean by a GPS receiver on a military jet plane in the 1990s, which was an eye-opener to a lot of people. So radar satellites that are designed for the job, they, they, they're they often using um, signals around um, 5 gigahertz C-band signals, um, and they bounce the signals off the ocean, and they measure the wind by the power of the backscattered signals or they might be um, nadir reflections if you're doing altimetry. So GNSS was looked, investigated as an alternative radar source for scatterometry and altimetry, originally over the ocean. And could we use the um, these GPS um, signals as a signal source and measure forward scatter at receiver for winds? Um, the great thing about this is you don't need a transmitter on your satellite. The, the, the signals are already there. You're using signals of opportunity. And there are many signal sources. So it can be done with just a modified GNSS receiver. It can be done on a small satellite. But the reflections are weak. Can they be received from space? Well, I think the first proof that it could be done was um, uh, some hard work that um, a lot of patients from Steve Lowe in JPL that demonstrated that um, he found some GPS L2 reflection from the CSC um, radar data during calibration stretch of data, four seconds or something. But then we put up an experiment on UKDMC um, in 2003 and collected GPS L1 reflections from a secondary antenna on a, a small satellite. And we did bit grabs of around 20 seconds. I worked with my colleague, Scott Gleason, on this um, years ago. And again, a lot of hard work and patience. We found that there were signals in the, the collections. Um, and unexpectedly, the reflections were received off many surfaces, not just the calmest oceans, as we expected. They were off rough ocean as well. And we picked up reflections off ice and land. So this really... Um, started the ball rolling of what reflectometry could do. And uh, we've been involved since the early days, um, since that UK DMC experiment. And it led on to us developing an instrument which we then um, flew on the UK Tech Demo Sat 1. And then we provided the instruments which enabled the NASA Cygnus hurricane sensing, which was eight satellites. and. Thanks to this work, and um, GNSS was shown to work in multiple domains. 
our original target was ocean wind and wave sensing. Um, but then we could see the sea ice extent and ice concentration. And then people started using the um, data and showing that it could be used to measure useful things over land. And that is what we uh, are doing with the hydrogen SS mission is targeting the land applications. So when we put together the case for um, hydrogen SS, we were looking at uh, what was the need. And really the hydrology, hydrological knowledge is, is the need. Uh, water is a natural resource. It's vital to climate, weather, life on earth. It's present on or inland in, in the form of soil moisture, wetlands and rivers, snow and ice and vegetation. And it's been identified that water related issues are amongst the greatest challenges facing population for the future. And global knowledge of land is, is uh, uh, um, land water is vital. If, if you eat food, then you have an interest in soil moisture, or at least an indirect interest. So the soil moisture is, is important for agriculture, flooding, weather. And then there's high latitude permafrost. And um, that is something that people are concerned about. Um, it could, if it thaws, then there could be methane emissions. Um, biomass is uh, the measurement, the knowledge of um, the above ground biomass is important because it affects our carbon stock um, and the biodiversity carbon um, sinks as well as emissions and wetlands again um, methane emissions and biodiversity these are four of the targets that we were um, targeting with um, hydrogen ss so models need measurements for understanding and predictions and um, in planning for the future tackling climate change earth system models need them for climate and numerical weather prediction need them for weather predictions so the hydrogen SS mission targets um, parameters which are linked to essential climate variables. Now, these ECVs have been defined by the Global Climate Observing System, which specifies 54 essential climate variables around the um, in, connected with the, the Earth for observation of the climate. And 60% and of these can be addressed by satellite data. So with hydrogen SS, we are targeting soil, biomass, permafrost, and wetlands. And, and some of them directly map to ECVs, and some of them are a bit less direct. Um, but we've used those to set our mission requirements and uh, um, build the mission around that. The mission uses GNSS reflectometry, which people are now well aware is a, it's a novel, complementary, and unique sensing technique. And it addresses a shortage in L-band measurements for uh, parameters such as soil moisture. Now here's an animation of hydrogen SS, which um, pictorially shows, there's the satellite. It shows the parameters that we're targeting. The permafrost, strictly speaking, the freeze-thaw um, active layer, the above ground biomass, soil moisture, and inundation or wetlands, flooding, and so on, um, by picking up reflections. The, this shows the GPS and Galileo satellites at the high altitudes. They're transmitting down continually and our satellite, Hydrogen SS, in, is in low Earth orbit. And what it's doing is it's pointing its antenna downwards and it's looking at the specular points, the reflective points. And it's uh, picking the, the best four reflections and it's putting them into delayed Doppler maps. Because it's L-band, it works through um, all weather, through rain, clouds, and it also works at night. And the parameters that we're using, um, targeting, uh, the the biomass, the wetland, um, the uh, the soil moisture, and the uh, the permafrost or the freeze thaw active layer above the permafrost, but we've got secondary targets, which is the ice extent, and also the wind speed over the ocean. Now the um, measurements are taken in these kind of tracks, four tracks at a time, and it's quasi random, so it's difficult to define the repeat. Um, track and so but what we can say is that over a period of um, 15 days it covers more than 80 percent of the globe with its measurements um, with two satellites and that is uh, the, the uh, picture again of hydrogen SS. 
So there have been other um, GNSS reflectometry satellites, uh, notably Cygnus, and before that TDS. And what we were measuring then were the, the established approach is to take measurements of the incoherent delay Doppler maps from GPS L1 at one hertz. So with HydroGNSS, we set out to add additional measurements to this. So we're adding Galileo, um, the European navigation system. That increases the coverage, and the codes are slightly longer, wider bandwidth, so it, it does change the parameters slightly. We're adding polarization. So we're adding a um, not only left-hand circular, but also right-hand circular um, antenna capability and taking measurements of DDMs at both polarizations. Um, we're adding a coherent complex channel, which runs at a much higher rate. So when there are coherent reflections, which is not all the time, but when there are um, flat surfaces and we can pick up coherent, then we can improve the resolution greatly using the coherent channel. We're adding the second frequency. Um, now, this is um, a bit of an unknown. It's wideband signals. We we know it's that the, over diffuse surfaces, these uh, signals are likely to be much weaker. Um, but when it's um, less diffuse, more coherent, then the signals could be stronger. Uh, the wideband signals could target the small features, um, and there's potential for higher resolution. I think we're we're looking forward to seeing what these measurements will um, um, produce. We do have simulations, so we are able to um, predict to a certain um, degree what to expect and what the error terms are that we expect for each of these measurements. And these additional measurements will help improve. It adds measurements of the same things that we're measuring before, but it also improves resolution. It, and we think it will help us to separate some of the confounding factors over land because Measuring the ocean um, wind speed is hard, but measuring over the land is much harder. There's so many parameters, so many things that can confound the soil roughness and the vegetation, uh, to name a couple. And by having these more measurements, that gives us more tools with which to separate out some of these parameters and confounding factors. So to build the case for hydrogen SS, um, we, we, we had to show that there was things that GNSS could measure. But at the same time, we had to be new. And um, we had to build a, a science case for something that was um, new and yet not too risky. And it was a bit of a, um, a difficult thing to balance the, the, the opposite um, requirements, but we managed to balance it somehow. And um, a good deal of help we had was from um, the, the Cygnus constellation. Cygnus has been showing some great things um, from the mission. And uh, it was very helpful to help build the case to show that it is possible to take these measurements from space, at least with the established measurements, and then build upon that with the newer measurements. So this is the uh, evidence for soil moisture. On the left, uh, the measurements taken from SMAP, which is a, a, a well-known NASA mission for measuring the soil moisture. Um, and uh, highly regarded as a reference uh, for uh, other measurements of soil moisture and other parameters. And you can see these um, um, time sequences produced um, by the Cygnus team show um, the changes in soil moisture from over Australia on the left from um, one month to another. So it gets drier and then it gets damper. And you can see the same changes on the right um, measured by Cygnus. And if you look carefully, you can see the individual tracks from the uh, uh, the GNSS reflectometry measurements. But you can also see that finer details are, are present, that the resolution that's being measured is, is higher resolution from GNSS reflectometry. And then um, something that um, GNSS ref um, reflectometry does spectacularly is, is measuring um, inundation and wetlands, particularly under vegetation. So there's a there's a very good example here from Clara Chu. The top plot on the right is the measurements from um, SMAP, um, the passive measurements of the Amazon Basin. You can see the rivers there, and you can see the resolution, the pixels. 
Um, the um, active part of SMAP, the, the radar, which sadly didn't last very long into the mission, but it, it gave it showed off its capability with some of its measurements. And you can see very high resolution measurements of the rivers um, from the uh, from the active uh, part of SMAP. And then underneath, you can see um, the measurements from Cygnus. And it's high resolution. It's not as high resolution as SMAP active. But the unique thing is that it's measuring all the rivers and tributaries, which are otherwise hidden by the, um, the rainforest, the vegetation. But because it's forward scatter and it amplifies the flat surfaces, it really highlights and brings out the flat surfaces, even when they're hidden under the vegetation. And there's really not much other technology that can do that. And then the um, evidence for forest biomass here, um, this is um, the, the principle is that you have reflections of the signals off surfaces, and then those signals are attenuated, both incident and reflected by the vegetation. So the information is in there, and it's a matter of getting the information out about how much vegetation attenuation is there. And the way that we've tracked that nut is through um, artificial neural networks um, by training and processing the data and then comparing it to um, independent maps of the biomass is showing a good relationship between what is measured with from Cygnus and what is understood by the uh, the these models of biomass. And then lastly, the evidence for soil freeze thaw and permafrost. This, these are measurements from TDS because Cygnus didn't reach the high altitudes. And they are compared with the, uh, um, the SMAP freeze thaw product in red. And the reflectivity from TDS is, you can see that there's an inverse relationship. It's measuring the um, reflectivity is, um, is, is stronger when you have um, the, the dips in the, um, in the uh, freeze-thaw product. So um, it shows that um, it, we were able to demonstrate that the uh, um, freeze-thaw can be measured. And what happens is when the um, when the soil freezes, it's suddenly the permittivity changes dramatically. So there's quite a strong signal in the reflectivity from that um, effect. So hydro GNSS and, and GNSS reflectometry in general um, does address a niche in application. So um, it's the basic measurements have, um, so we have a plot here which maps out the um, um, temporal and spatial resolution um, and applications. This is quite common to have this kind of a, um, a graph that um, shows idea, um, which um, areas benefit from different uh, temporal and spatial um, measurements. And, and you can see where SMOS and ASCAT have certain resolutions and they have quite a high um, revisit time. Hydrogen SS, a single satellite, or two satellites doesn't have such a good temporal resolution. You really need more satellites, but it's it's not bad with its uh, its spatial resolution. Now, when we move to the um, coherent channel, that does push us down to higher resolution measurements. We could potentially get down to around the kilometer level, um, where the um, surfaces have that kind of um, characteristics. And then by adding more satellites, if we went to 12 satellites or something, then it could be brought, the sub, um, the, the temporal resolution could be addressed. So that's represented by the hydrogen SS plus. So um, the more GNSS reflectometry satellites that are available, they don't all have to be hydrogen SS, there could be other missions, then that will help. If, they, if the data can be measured together, then that will help push the temporal um, resolution to something that becomes very valuable down to um, a daily or sub-daily measurements of soil moisture. Um, the hydrogen SS, when we were um, proposing it back in 2020, um, we knew how valuable um, the, the NASA SMAP mission and the ESA SMOS missions were. Um, they are highly prized by people for their measurements of the soil moisture, but they uh, are 
both pass the end of their um, design lifetime and there is no direct replacement for either of them. There are some satellites on the horizon. There's a satellite called CIMA um, that, that um, is being um, um, organized by the Copernicus um, in, but that's going to be 2028. Uh, we don't know the date for that. So there, there could be a gap. Um, I mean, everyone wants SMOS and SMAP to keep going, but they're past their design lifetime. Um, the other point to make from this graph is, is that um, SMOS was um, a satellite that's it, it's 650 kilograms, and it was back in 2009. That was around 350 million euros. So it was it was quite an expensive satellite. And if you look to the future, satellite like SIMA is going to be um, more than 400 million. I, we don't know the the the, the price yet. Um, but it will be quite an expensive mission. And, and I think SMAP was more like a, a billion of dollars. So these are big satellites. Um, they're, they're quite expensive. And the good thing about um, using GNSS reflectometry is it can be done on a small satellite. And, and essentially, the systems are, are much simpler. They can be done much cheaper. So it's a, it's a good complement to um, the, the high quality measurements taken by these big missions is that you can top them up with these smaller satellites doing GNSS reflectometry. So this slide um, it sets out the um, requirements for um, the Hydro GNSS mission. Um, and these requirements come from the ECVs, which are defined by the Global Climate Observing System. So that was, that was uh, very convenient that we've they've identified parameters that need to be measured and what their um, uncertainty and um, resolutions are required. And um, hydrogen SS maps into that quite nicely. So for the soil moisture, our goal is to get down to 0 0.0 for four meter cubed per meter cubed with the uncertainty. Our resolution is, is 25 kilometers, but um, we're hoping to push that um, to higher resolution measurements as well, down to the sort of one kilometer goal and inundation, 90% um, classification accuracy, soil freeze thaw state, 90% classification accuracy. Forest biomass, um, the goal is 20% is and uh, accuracy. So in addition to that, we have secondary objectives, um, making use of the, the, the progress from Cygnus and TDS on ocean wind measuring and ice extent. And we will be making a uh, level one delay Doppler maps available, plus the level two and level three um, geophysical products. Um, the timeliness is, is 31 days standard because it's primarily for climate um, applications where the, the timeliness is not so critical. But we do know that the, um, um, the weather forecasting is, is an important application. So we, we have a goal of, of fast delivery as well, and we do have a a view towards a faster delivery still of better than 24 hours, although that's not driving the um, the mission itself. And we are um, aiming to cover 80, more than 80% of the globe in 30 days or 15 days for two satellites. And we've captured these requirements in um, a mission requirements document. So this is a, a graphic sort of showing the measurements that we're aiming to take with hydrogen SS. And the ones with the red asterisks, the stars, are measurements that were taken by TDS. And then the green ones are the ones that we're trying to add. So that we're, we're, we're measuring the, um, the GPS left-hand circular polarized, but we're also adding the right-hand circular. We're adding Gal Galileo left and right. And we're also adding the L5. We're adding the coherent channel. And we're also adding, um, we've got the black body loads as similar technique to what was used on TDS and Cygnus for, for radiometric calibration. And we have the ability to do um, one or two targeted um, collections of sample data um, at the level zero A, um, so that they, they will be typically one minute of, of sample data, which can then be investigated in more detail. But otherwise, the, these measurements should be near continuous over both land, ocean, and ice. 
We've been doing a lot of um, science preparation activities. We're working with our science partners to raise the scientific readiness level. And we have the support of a science advisory group as well that helps steer our activities. Um, we have um, we are using a simulator generated by um, uh, Tor Vergata and um, Sapienza universities in Italy to provide a simulation of the reflections off land. And uh, the simulator is called H Savers. And that's plugged into a whole system called an end to end simulator that tests the uh, processes as well, the algorithms for inversion. And um, it, the simulator H Savers generates observations as if they were for an, in, in orbit. Um, so uh, geolocated delay Doppler maps with the coherent channel. And the measurements are processed through level one, level one extensions, and level two processes. And then they can be compared back to the source to um, assess the performance of the uh, processes. In addition to proving the science and working through the error budgets, this um, arrangement has allowed us to test out the um, level one and level two processes. We can test it with H savers. It can generate all the measurements. It can't generate huge volumes of the measurement because simulating reflections over the land is, is very demanding. Um, but it can give small amounts of data. What we can do is also use data from TDS to test out the processes through larger volumes of data. So we've been doing that as well. Now with um, GNSS reflectometry, we are measuring the power as, and that's, as I said earlier, that's that's not really how GPS is meant to be used. It's kind of a, a misuse of um, GPS GNSS signals. Um, they don't guarantee that the power is stable, but we measured it and generally the power is quite stable. There is this um, uh, operational mode where they change the powers called flex power on GPS. So we can't completely assume that they are stable, but a lot of the time they are very stable. So it is possible to um, map out the transmit power and map out the patterns of the satellites. And that's something we've been able to do with um, TDS-1 data and also with our, our, our little DOT-1 demonstrator satellite. And um, also with data from other satellites in orbit, some of the Sentinel uh, satellites, we've been able to pick up signals and map out. So first of all, you have to map out the um, receiver of the um, low Earth orbit. And then you you can map out the transmit. You have to take into account the fact that the GNSS satellites rotate slowly to keep their panels pointing at the sun. So you need to model their yaw and undo that. And when you do that, then you can um, map out their, the pattern that they're transmitting. And here's an example here on the right where, where there is a published pattern for the GPS satellite, satellite vehicle number 52. Um, and that's what's published. And then this is what we've measured um, underneath using data from uh, TechDemosat1. So we're able to map out um, the transmit signals and, and model what the uh, transmits powers are. The reason why we need to do that is that then once we know what the transmit powers are, we can, um, we can predict what the incident signal is. We need to know the incident signal that hits the surface because we're measuring the reflected signal, we want to know the ratio of reflected signal to the incident signal. And that tells us the reflectivity or the uh, sigma or whatever parameter it is we're using to measure the reflection capability of the surface. And that is, um, that is the key measurement that we're taking that allows us to do things like measuring soil moisture and mapping that to a, a, a simulation. Um, and if it turns out that the transmit powers are changing, then we can use the um, direct signal to uh, correct it dynamically. And that's something that Cygnus has been pioneering. So we have the ability to measure um, and correct in both those methods. And it's also combined with a method that NOC um, has pioneered, which is taking measurements over the ocean. The ocean has variable wind um, speed and roughness. But if you take the average of the ocean, it, it tends to average out. So you can use the ocean as a calibration target. 
And um, the other things that we need to take into account, the fact that the antenna noise varies. So we, we can't measure signal to noise, which is what we did when we started in this journey. But um, we now know that the antenna noise varies a lot. So we have to measure absolute reflected signal and separate it out from the antenna noise. And to do that, we need to calibrate the, uh, the gain of the uh, receiver. And we have an onboard black body load that allows us to do that. And we also has, can use the Antarctic target to test these things out. So that's the radiometric calibration. I mentioned that the antenna noise varies. So that's if you're just ignoring the reflected signals and just look at the noise that comes out when you point an antenna downwards. And you can see here some examples of how the antenna noise changes um, over the globe. Um, so if you fix the gain, uh, normally GPS receivers have an automatic gain control, but if you fix the gain, then you can measure how much the antenna noise varies. And this is in, in this case, we're looking at noise after GNSS correlation. So it's amplifying signals that look a bit like GNSS signals. Um, it's kind of match filter for GNSS. And you can still see that even after GNSS correlation, you can still see some patterns. And there are some surprise hotspots. If you look at the um, equatorial oceans, then you're seeing things that look like GNSS signals are being amplified here. And um, over land, suddenly it gets quieter. This was quite the opposite of what we were expecting. We thought that the, the ocean would be the quiet zone and land would be more noisy from man-made interferers. But it's actually the opposite. And what we think is happening is that the... Um, the other satellites that are transmitting GNSS signals from space, all the GNSS constellations are are reflecting off the ocean. There's, it's saline and near the equator, it's fairly calm and flat. So you're getting quite strong reflections off the, um, off the oceans near the equator. And that is the um, antenna noise you're seeing. Um, so we're also seeing, you, you can't help but notice that there are some very strong signals which are not the same source and we've got some examples here there's some um, in the middle east and there's some off of california um, and um, you you can imagine in certain areas of hotspots that gnss is a very um, uh, important frequency band so uh, that, that's why it's it's kind of we're seeing that in geopolitical hotspots, but we also know that the that, that different organizations do tests um, out at out of the ocean. Um, so it's not surprising to see some test um, emissions. If you go there another day, you probably don't see anything. So these things will come and go. Um, but if we're trying to use this for measuring reflectometry, these, these um, signals could upset us. So we need to be aware the very strong um, signals um, could um, corrupt our measurements. So we need to try and be aware of them and flag them. Um, certainly fixing the, the gain or uh, knowing what our gain is, we can take away most of it, but there will be some times when it's very strong and we need to flag it and remove it. Coming back to hydrogen assess plans, um, um, I'm beginning to run out of time. I haven't got much more to go, so I will I will finish up soon. So the ground user segment will be producing level one, level two, and level three data. Um, it's the payload data ground segment, and that is um, processes provided by the uh, the science team. And we expect to be um, commissioning for six months. The data from Hydrogen SS is owned by ESA. Um, there will be documentation, um, but it will be distributed as a free and open basis. There will be documentation available. There's a website which will give a point of contact. Um, this is a little bit about the satellite, 60, 65 kilogram satellite. It's got very good attitude. It's got a high data rate downlink. Um, it's um, a ride share on Vega. Um, we're targeting the end of this year or beginning of next year for launch. Um, and um, the satellite is going to be nominally tilted at minus 20 degrees pitch. That will increase the coverage, and it also improves the... Um, um, there'll be more information from the cross-polar measurements. Um, here's some pictures of where we are at the moment with the satellite. 
Um, you can see the instrument, um, the low noise amplifiers, the nadir antenna, and here on the right is a picture of a satellite. We're just finishing the hard stack at the moment with the first satellite. Second one is close behind. Uh, ground segment is in a, in a good shape. We're beginning to put through tests. Um, and sorry, the launch baseline is a ride share, um, either late this year or early um, next year. And um, so we're summarizing here, the, there is a pressing need for soil moisture sensing um, and um, the accurate weather forecast needs soil moisture, um, soil moisture for flood warning, um, climate sensing. Um, SMOS and SMAP are um, near the end of their lives, the no immediate replacement. And GNSS reflectometry is recognized as an alternative approach. Um, and this summarizes what hydrogenSS is about. And so to conclude, um, I talked a bit about Surrey Satellite Technology as a small satellite pioneer. Um, GNSS reflectometry has transitioned from concept of doubtful feasibility, but now it's established as a low cost but effective remote sensing technique. HydroGNSS is targeting climate variables, as I mentioned before. And it's, it's a showcase for new measurements for hydrology. And it prepares the way for a constellation of small satellites, which is sustainable, beneficial for weather, flood, and climate monitoring. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you for giving us this talk. Uh, everyone, we now have both the chat and the Q&A open. Um, so if you have any questions, you can also raise your virtual hand. I guess while we wait for questions to come in, um, one question I can ask is, you, know, you you made some comments about sort of the price point of these missions that we're familiar with, you know, like SMAP or SMOS. Do you have a sense, like, if this continues, what the steady state difference in price point would be with this technology versus those for a, for a mission? I think that's a very hard one to answer because, um, you know, um, uh, when when you are building something for a NASA mission or an ESA mission, um, it, it's done in a different way. It's a different basis. If you're doing something for a commercial mission, uh, the way you approach things will be a bit different. Um, and and so with the um, with these um, international um, science missions, there will be more scrutiny and there will be more discussion and there will be more openness. Um, collaboration, which are not necessarily um, ingredients for, for a commercial low-cost approach. Um, and hydrogen SS, people say it's new space, but it's somewhere in between. It's it's using the new space approach that we've used on other missions for SSTL, but it's also using the scientific approach that is used by the bigger missions. So I don't think you can judge um, completely by um, a mission like hydrogen SS that uh, what the commercial costs are. And I think it also depends on what the, um, the what the requirements are. But I would say that when we did TDS and when we did dot one, um, those were in the matter of of, of uh, millions. Um, they could be done very cheaply. Um, I think they can be done um, even cheaper potentially if you're doing them by scale. Um, so it, it's it's a difficult one to answer that, that the the components are not that expensive. Um, so I think it comes down to the the, the direction of the mission and the um, uh, the applications, the customers, how many um, plates you're trying to keep spinning at the same time or can you focus on one measurement? Um, all these things make a big difference to uh, the scoping and the costing of a mission, but it can be done. It can be done quite cheaply, I think. Great. So we've had some questions come in here. There's a number of them about data. So just to quickly go through them, one is how to get more data about this mission and how it can be used for disaster management. Another is, is the data open source? Can it be gotten outside of Europe? Um, 
And I guess those are those are the main data questions. Okay, well, let's start with the first question: How to get more data on this mission, and how can it be used for disaster management? There, there are a few papers. If you, so, and they should be open source um, papers on hydrogen SS. There's there's a there's a couple of lectures on online. Um, it's got similar information to what we have here. We are we do have a website. It's only a placeholder at the moment, but we will try and get more information onto the website as we get closer to launch. How can it be used for disaster management? That's that's a very good question. I, I don't think it's been designed for disaster management, this mission as such. It's really aimed at climate variables, but we are we do have a um, an eye on uh, disaster management applications. I think the most obvious one is, is flood monitoring, that it could provide measurements on um, flood mapping quite quickly. Um, the, the good thing about this is that it could measure flood extent under vegetation and under clouds when um, optical satellites couldn't. So I think it's a it could be a, a good complement for uh, flood monitoring, in particular with disaster management. I guess you could say droughts is another kind of disaster, and that's a bit more longer term. Um, so the measurements towards the climate, you could say, are trying to help against climate uh, against climate disaster. So I think that longer term. Um, measurements will be used by uh, climate scientists. Okay, I'll move on to the next question. Is the data open source and can you get it outside Europe? Um, it's The data is, is, is not owned by SSTL, it's going to be owned by um, ESA, and they are, are going to be releasing this data on a free and open basis um, via our website. So um, level one and level two data um, and level three will be uh, made available um, outside Europe. Um, okay, what Great. is the GNSS band? Um, that's 1.6 gigahertz. Um, the frequency, it's a frequency band. Um, it's one point, strictly speaking, it's 1.575 for the L1 band. That's the one that we have used, done most of our measurements, but we're now introducing the L5 at 11.76 megahertz, 1.176 megahertz. So those are the kind of frequencies. The wavelengths are around um, 19 centimeters for the L1 band. The next question: um, Could you please expand on the benefits of from using more than one more GNSS signals than only one constellation? Um, the uh, similar the animation that I showed you um, demonstrated that we picked up four reflections at once. Um, and that's what we did with with Cygnus, and that's what we did with TDS. But we're not limited to four reflections. We could um, pick up more reflections. I mean, we're trying to pick up um, dual frequency, dual polarization, which means that we end up using 16 channels uh, with large DDM. So that's one of our limits is the processing and the handling of data. But um, if we had smaller delayed Doppler maps, um, then we could pick up more reflections. It's, it's the beam width of your antenna. Um, and if there are more satellites up there, so we start using Beidou as well, or QZSS, these other signals, they will help fill in the gaps because we're only measuring along the tracks. So we're not measuring images, we're measuring tracks. But the more tracks we get, the more it fills it in. And you can see the same thing with Cygnus because they have eight satellites, it fills in the gaps. But by adding more constellations, GPS, Galileo, Beidou, GLONASS, these other signals will help fill in those gaps quicker so that you can get daily revisits more quickly. Um, next, so next question. Expanding on the previous benefits from using L1 and L5, benefit from using more than one constellation. So I, I talked about having more reflection points that fills in the gaps. The L5 is remains to be seen. Um, our simulations show that it's going to be often quite a bit weaker. So I think a lot of the time the L5 signals are not going to be strong enough to help us. But there will be times when the L5 signals will be stronger. When you have flatter surfaces, you'll get stronger L5 signals. And um, they could provide additional looks. Um, they could provide slightly better resolution, possibly. Although if it's down to the, um, down to the really coherent reflection that's not going to make a huge difference. So um, I think we're waiting to be surprised by L5. You you have to remember when we did our first experiment, some people assured us that 
reflex GNSS reflectometry wouldn't work at all. So we are being prepared to be surprised with the L5, um, but we think it will help with um, better resolution is the main benefit. Next question. Can you use active transponders for the calibration of hydrogen SS? That's a good question. Um, there was a, um, a, um, a, a campaign uh, that Cygnus had. They, they had a transmitter that transmitted signals that were picked up by, um, well, certainly by TDS before Cygnus was launched and then by Cygnus. Um, and um, in principle, you can use that to, um, to transmit a known power so that you can then calibrate radiometrically, radiometrically calibrate the performance of your receiver. Um, there are practicalities in doing that. The biggest problem is that if you start transmitting a powerful signal in the GPS L1 band, you may find that the authorities are not too pleased about that. You, do, you can't just transmit in the GPS band well, some people do, but that's uh, kind of outside the law. If you want to stay with inside the law, then then there's a problem. You have to get special license, um, which can be done, but it's not easy. Um, so um, it's not. We're not planning on doing that necessarily at the moment, but there is that potential. Um, next question: Could you tell about receiving antennas? Do they have special pattern? What size of every antenna? There's a trade-off um, with these. Um, you, you obviously want to have an efficient antenna. You don't want to lose signals in uh, a loss if you can avoid it. Um, you want to have the most efficient antennas. Then you, you're, you're trying to balance the, the laws of physics. You, you can either have a high gain, um, in which case it's a narrow beam, or you can have a lower gain and a wide beam. Um, and it comes down to... Um, the measurements that you are targeting both work, by the way. Um, so for um, Cygnus, they had quite high gain patterns, 14 and a half dB gain. For the other extreme is dot one that we launched, and that has a gain of about 8 dB, and both of them work. Um, and dot one has a wider beam width. Um, it can pick up signals from um, a much, uh, quite a wide area, although having said that, Cygnus had two antennas pointing either side. Um, but but the problem is that with dot one measurements is that they won't have the benefit of the high gain. The gain pushes the signal to noise up. So it depends on where you're concentrating your measurements. Over most of the ocean, most of the land, you don't need very high gain. But there are times when you need the high gain. If you're measuring over a forest, there's a lot of attenuation there. So you need the high gain for that. The other place is hurricanes, which, of course, uh, Cygnus was aiming at that you want the higher gain, it can bring the signal to noise higher. It means that you can get more lower variance in your signal measurements, improved accuracy. So it, it varies. For hydrogen SS, we've gone for a, a bit uh, antennas on the higher side, higher side of the gain, um, but we're also trying to do the dual polarization um, and the dual frequency, which makes it quite a constrained, difficult antenna design, but we've done the best we can. And uh, it's got a gain of around um, 12 dB or so um, on each of the bands. And the, the beam width is around 45 degrees for 6 dB beam width. All right, well, next question. We're, we're approaching the hour here. So I think we probably okay. need to wrap. But if you have additional um, questions, Martin, I'm sure you can email him. Uh, I would okay. thank you again for making time and sharing this with us. And to remind everyone, again, that we do this every month. Uh, and to send us names of nominations of folks you'd like to see. With that, thanks again. Martin. All right, I think I think we'll wrap it up there, and perhaps email we can email um, answers. So thank you very much for having me, and um, it's been a pleasure to talk to you today.